This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in everybody to this week's episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, Adam the Jock Straczynski. On today's show, does WWE have its own forbidden door? And is it opening soon? Sticking with open doors, what's going on with Carl Anderson, New Japan, and WWE? As well as, we've got some big names making debuts on wrestling organizations. And Vince McMahon, his investigation, looks like it might have wrapped up. We've got all of the fallout from that. On top of that, you know we're going to cover the biggest topics and trends in wrestling. And we do have a pay-per-view. We have Crown Jewel coming up on Saturday afternoon at noon. You're going to want to tune in, listen, get our predictions, see who's right. Doing it with me as always, he's the one, he's the only, he is the Doc John Macaroon. What's up, cuz? Always a great time breaking down the world of professional wrestling. So much to get to. Breaking down a pay-per-view already here in November. Oh my goodness, can't wait for it. It'll be a good time. The Saudi shows typically don't produce too much change, but you never know. After Clash at the Castle, maybe some surprises could go down this weekend. I'm looking forward to breaking it all down. Yeah, absolutely. There could be some big changes. We're going to get into our Crown Jewel predictions here shortly. But first, let's take a look at what took place on with WWE this week. Uh, We're recording this a little bit early so we can get this out a little bit early because we're running on Saudi time and pay-per-views take place in the middle of the afternoon on Saturdays. So uh, we didn't get a chance to take in SmackDown. We haven't had a chance to take in Rampage, but we did get to watch Monday Night Raw, got to watch Dynamite, and uh, there's some stuff that came out of that. And I think first things first, where I want to kind of kick this off is Austin Theory. Vince McMahon left, Triple H steps in, And it really feels as though Austin Theory Theory has been left unprotected. And recently he's been booked in quite a few losses. Is this really the best thing for his character? It almost feels like Triple H is booking him as a nerd. Not quite getting squashed. He goes out there, and this week he had a pretty good match, but still taking loss after loss. And really and truly, the only thing that he has to his name right now is that briefcase that says Money in the Bank. What are your thoughts on on Austin Theory basically getting booked to take L's? Exactly. That's the crazy part is you see a character that was basically at the top of the card, riding high, looking like he was going to be a prominent individual. All of a sudden, you see this change in management, and for whatever reason, maybe they're slowing down on his ascent, um, maybe because it was too soon, too fast. And sometimes, for whatever reason, in WWE, things change at the drop of a hat. It is curious to see, and you ask a great question, is it meaningful that, unfortunately, the guy with the money in the in the bank briefcase is taking losses? I, I look at it like I, I it kind of has the feel that Theory will cash it in and lose, or we'll wait, and I don't see like the same ascent that you would see, obviously, on AEW with MJF. It doesn't feel that way in any capacity, and I think that for whatever reason, right now, Theory is not being prominently featured in, in terms of his push, but it, it, it's fascinating because you have this character with the Money in the Bank briefcase, but it's not going anywhere. It's a, it's a weird dynamic, especially from where he was, because it, now it's noticeable. Yeah, and look— I'm not sure what direction Triple H wants to take Austin Theory's character in. But to me, this almost feels like I see you this way, Vince seen you this way, and he's not here. So we're going in this direction. What they could do and what could happen, they could have Austin Theory hold on to this briefcase up until the very last moment. And leading up to that, kind of book him uh, like he like he's a jabroni, right? Where he's just taking loss after loss after loss. And maybe... Maybe a, a week, maybe two weeks out before he cashes this in, he starts racking up a couple of wins here or there. And that way it makes his victory when he does cash it in. And I, I'm assuming eventually he gets the title. I mean, this this is the guy who has been predicted or or basically gifted the reins to be the future of WWE. 
when he cashes it in and he wins the championship, at that point, maybe he goes on a win streak. But it's really weird to kind of watch how he's being booked compared to how he was being booked. Look, he did take an L to to uh, Pat McAfee uh, at what was it WrestleMania, but other than that, the guy has has pretty much won. It wasn't like it was fifty fifty booking that we get a lot of times with a lot of characters. So it's just it's it's different to see it go this way, where he's having really good matches, and I think he's come a long way from when he first won the Money in the Bank briefcase. I think he's come he's come quite a ways. His like in his in ring action is actually very very good. And I think he's doing a very good job. It's just weird to see him taking loss after loss after loss. Uh, I'm not sure if, if this is the best thing for this character, but I do see his in-ring work getting better, and I do believe that when he does go to cash that in, he is walking away with the championship. I have no doubt about that. Hmm. We have a uh, new female, female tag team champs as Alexa Bliss and Asuka returned to Monday Night Raw. They've been out of action for a couple of weeks now. Haven't seen them. They show up. Uh, slide of the ring to help save Bianca Belair. And then later on in the back, they demand a title shot against Io Sky and Dakota Kai. And they end up winning the championship. This is a little bit surprising, but was it the right choice? How shocked were you that we have new female tag team champs? And is this the right direction to go in? Well, it's very interesting. The tag holders in the women's division are not keeping the belts. Now, you and I are kind of in lockstep in that we we are kind of been proponents of, well, look how amazing the WWE has done with the Usos and their reign of a couple of years now and Roman Reigns bordering on three years without being pinned. So that's amazing. That is spectacular when you look at the next person that takes the titles off of the Usos and Roman Reigns is going to be viewed with the utmost respect. They've solidified those two championships, but I'm not feeling it the same way. It's been bounced around too much. It kind of takes away from the prestige of the belt. Now, do the right holders have it? Absolutely. I think Alexa Bliss and Asuka, probably arguably two of the best women now thrown together. Obviously for me, I would prefer them having individual success. I just feel like Alexa Bliss is a star She has so much to give creatively to her character. Oh my God, what a creative individual that you still feel like the creative team could tap way more into. And now you look at Asuka, who for a time being was really, when she won the Royal Rumble, was on the heater of a lifetime, has just cooled off over the last year and a half to to the point where, you know, it's just been a complete irrelevant situation, which is really crazy because of the talent that she has. So this this gives them more credibility. It's great. But for them, I'm hoping it's November. I just hope they don't lose it at least until past the Rumble. Kind of start to build your women's tag division by having quality matches and, and stopping and slowing down the transfer of the titles. Yeah, look, I, I thought this was was one shocking and two, I just don't get it. Look, Alexa Bliss... Everybody's kind of into her still. And I say kind of into her still. Asuka feels like a wet fart in church. Her character seems stuck. There's been zero growth. There's been zero change. She's the same same character. She gets on scream and she just screams, Asuka! Ah! And I, I don't know about you, but it doesn't do anything for me. I actually, when she shows up, I basically mute my television because I don't want to hear her scream. That being said, Io Sky and Dakota Kai... Ever since there was the tournament to to crown a new female tag champs, they've almost felt like they're kind of stuck in place. And, and it's the whole con- the whole damage control group. It just kind of feels like it's it's like a rudderless ship. They they ended up getting stalled out as they weren't the initial winners of that tournament. They end up turning around and getting the titles a few weeks later. Like you said, nobody can hold on to these belts for a very long time. And then all of their 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 challenges and all of their 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 matches, they just kind of feel very one note. There's nothing that you can like you could say, hey, what was their best tag team match? I don't know. Like, I can't think of anything that was really great or anything that was even really good. You know, I know that they've had matches. There was nothing memorable about their title run. You know, they, they were given the belts and that was kind of it. And same thing with damage control as a whole. Damage control as a whole feels very blah. Very one note, very whatever. Like Eo Sky, Dakota Kai, they don't do anything for me. And Bailey, besides being the leader of this group, 
I could take or leave. Like when she came back at SummerSlam, it was a big deal. But at this moment in time, it's very, very one note. It's very meh. And it, it, honestly, it just it just feels it feels flat. And Bailey's character, specifically with Bailey's character, feels like it's this mash of her old heel character and this new heel character. And it just it just doesn't work for me. These three girls together don't work for me. This group doesn't work for me. This this whole damage control, since they've basically gotten their name, it has lost steam. And there's like nothing, nothing good going on here. So I'm not sure if maybe Crown Jewel can breathe some new life into them. I'm not sure what ends up happening at Crown Jewel, but I think that group, damage control specifically, needs to hit a reset button as well as Asuka. Was there anything else on Monday Night Raw that really caught your eye or anything else from WWE that you're like, look, that was a standout moment. I feel like we need to talk about that, and it helps build towards this pay-per-view that we're about to get into. That helps build? No. I thought it was a good Monday Night Raw. It kind of put everything into perspective with everything that's going on. I thought Raw you know, really encompassed a good three hours. I like Bianca Belair and what she's doing. I think some of the work that she's been doing over the past few months, you got to give her credit. I think that, man, she just is just a character that when she comes out, everybody pops, everybody pays attention. You, you realize, okay, that when she's in the ring, people are going to focus and pay attention, usually has quality matches. So I'm excited for some of these feuds to have a payoff. And I think that's where it is is that a lot of these feuds have been culminated, they're good, and now we get the payoff this Saturday afternoon. Yeah, like you said, Saturday afternoon, 12 o'clock on the Peacock Network. We've got Crown Jewel taking place from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Let's get into our predictions. This is a pretty big card. This this card used to be almost comical. It was basically the the the... What is it? The the Sultan, the the leader, the king, the prince of, of Saudi Arabia. I'm not sure what the monarch's actual title is, but the monarch of Saudi Arabia, he basically was like, hey, WWE, I want you to come here and I want you to do a show specifically for me. I'm going to give you money. Entertain me. <laughs> and oh, by money, I'm going to give you a buttload of money. Here's a couple billion dollars. Come here for the next seven years and entertain me. And WWE would throw this card together that was it was like dream matches but they were like dream matches from like the late <laughs> 90s early 2000s this is much more up to date like we actually have things going on in wwe that are going to take place at crown jewel they've worked it in to be i, I want to say since the last pay-per-view it's been a little bit of a better pay-per-view a little bit more decent this used to be something that we could just kind of not pay attention to because it didn't make any sense it was like if you're a comic book fan, it was like non-canon storylines. It just it was just matches put together for whomever. Uh, this stuff is actually in storyline. This stuff is actually canon, as we can say. And let's start with the big match, the 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 the, the top match on the card. I have an idea where you're going because it's probably where I'm going. We've got Roman Reigns defending his undisputed WWE Universal Championship against Logan Paul. Logan Paul will have his brother in his corner. Uh, was it Jake Paul, I think, will be in his corner backing him up. So I don't know if that comes into play, if there's any shenanigans that takes that takes place here. Obviously, Sami Zayn has never attended one of these. Sami Zayn will not be there. I'm assuming that you will have the rest of the bloodline there as the Usos have a match. I'm assuming Solo Sokoa will be there and Paul Heyman will be there as well. So maybe you've got Jake Paul to kind of offset some of what the, the the bloodline might bring to the table. How do you see this match going, and who do you see winning this? Yeah, so with the Paul leading the company, now let's see all the future storylines that can emanate. No, all kidding aside, it's a made-for-television match. It's just to draw as many eyes as possible. I wonder if the Saudi prince was like, I want to see these two in the ring. There's no chance that Roman Reigns does not win. I just want to see how, how over does Paul get when... Uh, he gets into the ring in Saudi Arabia. I mean, SummerSlam was great. He's continued to train. I think it's going to be a great match. I think it will surprise a lot of people, but no way Logan Paul wins. Uh, Jake Paul being on the outside, great. It'll be fun. It'll be more for the entrance. Like, what kind of shit is he going to do? Is he going to come in mm -hmm. with, like, 15 people holding him? Is he going to come in old school? It'd be funny. Is if he got in one of those carts and just had, had, it, had it driven down to the ring? That'd be funny. In, in a lot of ways, you can do a lot of pomp and circumstance with this, but... I mean, nobody in their right mind would pick Paul to walk away with a title. 
Yeah, I think you'd be crazy if you thought Logan Paul was actually walking away <laughs> the, the undisputed WWE Universal Champion here. Um, I think what's going to play out in this match, though, again, you're, you're continuing to build Logan Paul. You're continuing to make him a star. I think he, he hits his move. He hits that one punch that knocks Roman Reigns out. But I think when that happens, that's when you have some of that outside interference. That's when a guy like Solo Sokoa gets involved. That's when maybe one of the Usos get involved. That's when something crazy and wonky happens. But I think he gets his move off. I think he knocks Roman Reigns out for a minute. Roman Reigns has to lean on a little bit of outside interference to, to basically regain his footing. Hits the spear, gets the one, two, three. He's leaving Saudi Arabia with his championship. I don't think Logan Paul takes it away from him. I think it will be a really good match because, like you said, Logan Paul has continued to work. He's put in a lot of effort. Every time he's gotten in the ring, he looks like he belongs. There's not been one moment where he's been in the ring where we're like, this dude doesn't belong here at all. Every time he's been in there, you and I both have left with our jaws open and our mouths on the ground and just like, dude, this guy's good. Like, shockingly, he is good. And I expect the same thing in this match. I still think Roman Reigns wins, though. We've got Bobby Lashley taking on Brock Lesnar. We're going to hit repeat on this match. How do you see this one playing out? Man, it's tough, right? I see This is a tough one. It's a tough one. It's tough because, naturally speaking, it should be Brock Lesnar, but he's part-time. Would he come back to put over Bobby Lashley? That's crazy. Um, but in the end, I have to look at it from the perspective of what do the Saudis want? How do they want? They want to cheer. And I think Brock Lesnar, uh, I think you could still have Bobby Lashley lose but still get his shit in, really be powerful. But in the end, how do you have Bobby Lashley beat Brock Lesnar when there's no real indication that he's on his level. It's Brock Lesnar all the way. See, I, I love the way you think because you and I think really similarly. And while I was trying to figure this match out, I'm like, look, it only makes sense for Bobby Lashley to beat Brock Lesnar because Bobby Lashley's full time. Brock Lesnar is not full time. But then I'm like, this pay per view is basically dedicated to an audience. Like it is, it is part of storyline, but it is still dedicated to an audience. And even though Brock Lesnar's part time, Bobby Lashley already beat him once. I think we get we get the score even here. And I think Brock Lesnar beats Bobby Lashley. And honestly, what I think this sets up for later on, later on, we can get we can get the 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 feud to settle at all. We can get Bobby Lashley, Brock Lesnar at some other point. This will be round three, winner take all. So I think Brock Lesnar gets the win, and I think it's because of an audience that we are we are trying to appease. Look, it doesn't necessarily make sense because Brock Lesnar just showed up, but I think he still gets the W. Uh, poor Bobby Lashley takes the L here. Now we've got Bianca Belair defending her championship against Bayley. This is for the Raw Women's Championship last woman standing match. Now these matches are always interesting because last woman standing, basically outside interference is allowed. And as... Many times as Alexa Bliss and Asuka has had Bianca Belair's back, they're still not part of her crew. There's still three wrestlers who wrestle separate from each other. Bailey, however, has backing. I could see and I could make an argument for Bailey to leave Saudi Arabia as the Raw Women's Champion. And I see Dakota Kai, EO Sky playing a part in that. I think Bailey dethrones Bianca Belair. I think they've got to figure out a way to rev up this damage control storyline because I think, like I said before, it is incredibly flat. It is it is boring and it is awful. I think you put a championship on Bailey, you have Bianca try to chase. Maybe you have Becky show up. Becky Lynch is supposed to be getting better. She's supposed to be coming back sooner than later from her separated shoulder. Maybe you could have a, a storyline there. I'm not sure. There's all these theories and all the speculation that. Sasha Banks could be returning. Maybe Sasha come, comes back because Bailey and Sasha have great chemistry together and they work well together. I'm going to put the championship on Bailey here. I'm not 100% confident. This is this is just guessing and this is trying to try to revitalize a storyline that has gone horribly awry. Yeah, it, it would be great. Yeah, it'd be more believable if it was taking place in the states. But being a Saudi show, I don't see big title changes happening in a show of this caliber. So it's going to be Bianca Belair. You got to establish her as a badass still. And I think that a lot of times in a, in a tough a toughness competition, you know, you naturally think, okay, interference, stuff like that. But I think it's a great way 
to continue to push Bianca Belair. And there's so much more that can be told at Survivor Series in, in regards to the championship. So I, I can't. I would be shocked if Bailey walked out the champ. All right. And look, I, I, I don't, I don't blame you for thinking that way. I'm just the way I see it, man. And I don't know if you agree. I feel like dam- the damage control storyline yeah, is good. incredibly damaged. It, yeah, it's, it hasn't been great. All right, we've got the Usos defending their championship against Butch and Rich Holland. This is for the undisputed WWE Tag Team Championships. I'm going to go with the Usos. I think what we're building towards here is the Usos versus the New Day for the longest tag team ever, uh, long, longest tag team reign ever. Uh, so I'm going to go Usos here. There's not much else I really think you have to put into it. Don't overthink this one. Yeah, just hopefully it's a nice brawl, a little bit of physicality, a lot of good high spots. It should be a great match. I think the crowd might actually get really, really into this match. I think the Usos will win as well. Yeah, another match I think the crowd might get into. We have a steel cage match. We've got Drew McIntyre taking on Karrion Cross. This one seems like there is a lot of... The way they've built it has been really, really good. A lot of animosity, a lot of heat between these two. Uh, Karrion Cross, like you said last week, basically wrapping legs around a dude, choking him out from behind and talking into a mic. Didn't really do it for you. Drew McIntyre trying to slam a dude's head into a car door or with a car door does it for me. How do you see this one playing out? Ooh, well, inside the cage, I think that when you look at the opportunities here, Drew McIntyre has had the early edge, but how do you bring back Karrion Cross and establish him? Drew can handle losses now for the next two years. He's so over. He's established. He is somebody that really has, in my mind, had his run, his big moment at Clash at the Castle. Two, two and a half seconds away from potentially being the world champion and really uh, having a crowd destroy an arena. It, w- it would have been awesome, an awesome moment. Now he's got to also take a look at creating a star, and that's your mission, Drew, is to make Karrion look like a badass. And so for me, it's going to be Karrion Cross. Yeah, I'm going to go Karrion Cross as well. I can see Scarlet interfering in this. I can see whoever Drew McIntyre's next opponent's going to be uh, interfering in this match and coming out. Look, the whole point of the steel cage is so nobody can interfere, but we always have interference with steel cage matches. There's always something that goes crazy. So I, I predict that's going to happen. I think Karrion Cross ends up getting the victory. Like you said, you've got this guy back here. He's got a great entrance. He's got a great look. Uh, Scarlet is fantastic looking, and she plays such an integral part in his character. You don't want to lose this. You want to build upon this. And you're right. Drew McIntyre has been champion. Drew McIntyre has been to the mountaintop. He has been the pinnacle. It's time for you now to make a star. This is your job. Make him a star. Make him look good. And I think he will. I think Karrion Cross comes out the winner here. The Judgment Day taking on the OC. How do you see this one working out? And remember, Rhea Ripley, I believe, is going to play a part in this. Don't be surprised if Judgment Day has something in store for her, has some type of contingency plan to take care of Rhea Ripley. I don't know who it could be. I don't know what it'll be. But I do think that they get a female to help kind of take care of Rhea Ripley. It'd be great, huh? It's tough because, you know, you could make the case the OC is a big enough name that the Judgment Day moving on from them would produce a a significant result. But at some point, the OC has got to get the payoff here for taking all the shit that they've been taking. So for me, I think it's the OC. I I definitely have a hard time picking against a returning tag team. I think that the Judgment Day needs to take a loss in order to reevaluate everything. You got to have the good guys, the faces sometimes overcome against you know the evil doers and the judgment day yeah they'll cheat yeah they'll try every scenario to you know take the lowest common road to get a w but the oc's got to kind of establish otherwise do you really want to have a mid-card oc i think that they, they can be top of the they you know i imagine them walking into a nice tag team feud you know, with, with cheers and, and, and being pushed along. Do you really come back and then start laying down for opponents? I think it's just clear the Judgment Day needs to lay down for the OC. So I'm going to go opposite. I'm going to go Judgment Day. And like I said, I feel like Rhea Ripley is going to play a huge part in this. I, I do feel that the OC is going to have a contingency plan for her. But the way that they've been booking Rhea Ripley, very reminiscent to China back during the Attitude Era, I think Rhea Ripley has that China-esque, undefeatable presence where whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, she's going to take you out. If she can beat up a dude, I do believe she can beat up a, 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 a chick, and I think that she'll be able to dispatch whatever that contingency plan is that the OC has for her and still interfere in this match to get the Judgment Day the victory. 
I think the Judgment Day ends up leaving. And more to your point, you've invested a lot of time and a lot of energy into the Judgment Day. Judgment Day is kind of over. I think not as over as the OC. And I think that's kind of why you need the Judgment Day to go over here, go over the OC. Because I think out of both of these groups, the one that could stand to lose would be the OC. And I think you help elevate the Judgment Day and you make them feel that much more important. This is supposed to be a group that is completely destructive and can mess up everything and mess up everybody. And I think that's why you want to keep investing in them. And it's important for them to get the win in this match. So I'm going to go the Judgment Day. Now we've got the Battle of the Titans here. And uh, no pun intended because that used to be Braun Strowman's old name. Braun Strowman taking on Omos. How do you see this one handling out? I think Braun Strowman needs to bring a step stool to climb up to, to box with God because Omos is huge. I know. I want to see Braun Strowman back in the ring. This one's tough. This one's a tough one because Omos... Eh. See, it's interesting because in my mind, I see Braun Strowman kind of taking that rocket ship ride over the next few months. And what a great way to kick it off against Omos. But it just kind of has to feel like if I pick that, then for sure it's going to be almost cheating or doing <laughs> something to win. But I can't. I mean, the right decision, best for business, is Braun Strowman going over. Yeah, I'm going to go Braun Strowman as well. Uh, look, I think he's a better wrestler. I think the crowd's more invested in him. I think he's the guy. I know Omos is as tall as a house, but I think Braun Strowman's the dude. All right, we've got Alexa Bliss and Asuka defending their newly acquired tag team championships against Dakota Kai and Io Sky. Bro, I have no clue. I don't know I don't know where to go in this one. I don't know how to pick this one. I don't know what to do. I mean, this is this is frustrating because if you were going to have a a, a a tag team championship change, wouldn't you have saved it for here? Wouldn't you have done it here? Wouldn't it have made more sense if it was on this show instead of on Monday Night Raw? I, I don't know where we go with this. I, I'm going to say Alexa Bliss and Asuka retain their titles, but I'm not confident. No, I'm very confident. That's what's going to happen. You're absolutely right. They should have just did it, but did it at the show. That I mean, y- you have to have some level of, hey, some level of intrigue that not all your title matches are going to be retained by the champions because that, that just makes the show a glorified house show. You could have had this perfect title change. It would have been a surprise, but who knows? Maybe there's been a cap this year on how uh, how much Saudis can cheer for women. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, it'll be interesting to see, obviously, the long sleeve shirts that all these ladies got to wear. You shall not be seeing a lot of skin in this card mm-hmm. in terms of the ladies. So um, it'll be interesting to see. It'll, it'll be funny. All the match, all the men's matches go 13 minutes. All the women go like four. So yeah. <laughs> you realize, okay, we got to get, get the women ladies. will be in those uh, those onesies that you used to wear as a kid for pajamas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In like and out. Footy pajamas. In and out. So we'll see what happens. But the the, the champs retain. And then we're going to get a Bray Wyatt appearance. Don't know what the hell is happening there, but he's set to, to show up at the show. Uh, that means we really only have two differences here. Uh, I've got I've got Bailey winning the the women's uh, championship, the Raw Women's Championship. You've got Bianca Belair, and then I've got the Judgment Day, and you've got the OC. Nice. As far as calling the card goes, I lead by six, thirteen to seven. This is definitely a show where you could make up a ton of ground on me. Uh, let's jump right into to AEW. I'm going to be honest with you. In my notes here, I've got it felt very WCW TNA ish, like like late 90s, early 2000s WCW and mid 2000s TNA. We had a debut of Jeff Jarrett. Uh, He lays out Darby Allen and then he cuts a promo on basically everybody. Double J has been appointed the AEW director of business development. I'm not entirely sure what that means or what that is. And I'm not sure that he's the guy that you want to do that. Everywhere Double J has ever gone, whether it be WCW, TNA, whether it's been his – in the NWA, whether it's been him trying to sell gold, it usually means financial ruin for a, a company. He's usually not very good with, with the money aspect of things. He's really good at booking wrestling, and, and he's pretty good at, at, at doing stuff in the ring. But when it comes to money, he's not the greatest. So I'm not really sure what, what his direct role is in AEW, but – He's also going to have an on-screen character, and he's going to have an on-screen role. And I want to know, where do you think this storyline goes? Because, again, he cut a promo on everybody, called out Sting. And, and, and where do you think it's going to go? But better yet, where do you want it to go? Where do you want his storyline to, to basically end, at least this initial one? He, he said slap nuts. Dude, that was cool. I popped. Um, <laughs> <laughs> dude, uh, he looked good. He looked in shape. It was a surprise. Really not needed. I thought my understanding was he's going to work with a team of people to just basically expand the house shows 
basically be in charge of kind of booking the kind of increased uh, shows that are going to likely take place over the next couple of years, business development, ma- meaning that, okay, you, you have a couple of shows a week. You maybe want to add one more, develop relationships with the, with the venues and start touring at a higher level. I don't think he's going to be responsible for the financial ruin of, of AEW because it seems like the money pit is basically flush with cash. If you're bringing on, well, Sor- if you're bringing I, I, look, on Soraya Tony- and you're bringing on Double J and Sting and all these old people, listen, there are some people that if you really think about it, uh, AEW makes money, or it could be a great situation where you have a guy worth ten billion dollars, but if he has a company that loses a hundred million, in the end, it's free for him because he saves money. It's crazy to think about, but there are companies where you can have just unlimited cash flow that never has to make money. Like you can see every year, okay, this year it lost ten million, next year it lost eight million. Hey, this year it made two million, then the next year it loses three million, loses five million. But for a guy that has ten to twenty billion dollars, it makes no difference because he has money coming out of his ass. That losing money is not a big deal. When you see these signings, what does Double J add to the roster? Nothing. The man is in his fifties. So I think these guys are like, yes, finally we got a billionaire with cash that I can call up and say, hey, I can do this, I can do that. And they're playing on his markdom. He's like, holy shit, you know Tony Khan with his with his fanboy persona was sitting back there. When the guitar hit Darby Allen, he got up out of his chair and had a huge grin, had to change his pants. Whereas you and I are just like, God damn, the 10,000th guitar shot? My God. But it did look cool. It just it didn't make any sense. Like, okay, you're in this group now. That's fine. You're going to be a badass. But you're right. It, it, for the first time, it had a feel of like, Jesus, this is like, is this 1980, 1989 again? Double J has been everywhere. And I just think that... For a lot of people, I do think that they talk nice of the company and they're like, get a run in. You can get mic time. I mean, they gave Jeff Jarrett five minutes on the mic. That dude probably hasn't talked for five minutes in 10 years. So listen, these guys are all the same. Big egos. And if you dangle TV time in front of them, they just run to the cash. And that's what they're doing. Yeah, I don't think he's going to be the the, the financial ruin of the company because I think all the money goes through Tony Khan. But it's weird to be put in a role where your actions will have a will have impact on the financial output. So it's going to be interesting to kind of see what happens. Look, Double J has been basically everywhere this year. He competed in in Ric Flair's last match. He was working with WWE before Triple H came in. He's now in AEW. This is going to be nuts. I think where his storyline goes and where I want it to go is I want it to go towards Sting. Look, they had a, a, a ton of interaction in TNA when they both wrestled there. They had a ton of interaction in WCW. I think you can it, it, when Sting gets healthier, when Sting comes back, I think Sting versus Double J will be absolutely fantastic. I think it'll be a really good uh, match. And look, all the old marks are going to pop for it. And I think that's kind of what you're getting here. It's just doing a little bit of service for some of your your older your older marks in the crowd. So that's where I think that ends up going. Now, we did get a very interesting vignette for the House of Black. I want to know what you thought of this. I actually loved it. I thought it was good. I thought that we were going to have Aleister Black be away for much longer. I thought Buddy Murphy was going to be away for much longer. I didn't think we were going to be getting the House of Black back as soon as it seems like we may. I think they're doing a a, a lot of really good things with uh, Julia Hart, I think she she plays a fantastic role in all of this. I thought it was a really, really good vignette. I thought this was was actually fantastic. I'll be honest with you, I wasn't very impressed with Monday Night Raw, and I wasn't very impressed with AEW this week. This was the one thing that I was like, this is good. This is really, really good. And and I, I actually loved it. I thought it was fantastic. What did you make of the vignette for House of Black? Very cool. Yeah, sometimes for wrestlers, it's really interesting in that sometimes – you know, we think that issues are larger than they are. Sometimes when you're working, you just need a vacation. Two, three weeks off, you get 21 days to live. You're not on the grind. You're not worried so much on my creativity, what I'm happy, I'm not happy. You, sometimes you get an opportunity to sit back a couple days. You think creatively on how you want to do things. You present it, and then the boss says, yeah, whereas before you get a lot of negativity. Sometimes just taking a step back, getting away, sipping cervezas, getting out of town, maybe going to Mexico, doing some things that you got to do to kind of regroup and recharge. And you come back and it just seems fresher. And then you appreciate everything that you've been doing. So I think these wrestlers, you know, that's why I think Sheamus is going to come back like a bad motherfucker, dude. Got married, got to connect with the bar, got to connect with all the WWE guys taking photos. He's going to come back like a renewed 
over character that could potentially be the next big thing because of just his pure toughness. So look for that. I think House of Black, same thing. A little time away, refresh the character, get out the burnout, come back, handle business. And it was very cool. It was the highlight because I'll be honest, you know, Ring of Honor has had some badass world champions. Badass. And I think they, they've showcased that over the time. When Chris Jericho issues an open challenge and it's Colt Cabana, it just kind of felt like a huge fart to me. I was like, ugh. And Colt Cabana, to me, you know, with the podcast and all the issues that you're going to talk about, you would think that he'd get his shit together. The dude looked like he had never wrestled. It looked like he had a tryout match. To drop Chris Jericho, to have that sloppiness, and just to be honest, it just looks like Colt Cabana's past his prime. I was disappointed in the whole Ring of Honor match. Didn't like it. I, li- I like the rest of Dynamite, but that segment was a huge flop, and I, I just was disappointed in, in in the whole delivery. I'll be honest with you, the I was I popped for Cole Cabana coming out. Oh. I think it, I think it signals that mixed with the vignettes that you've got for the elite. I think it signals something that we've all known is that CM Punk seems to be done with this company, and and to me it, it felt almost like like a victory lap, like, like the, the locker room flushed the diarrhea out of its system. The diarrhea was CM Punk. So I look, I know it wasn't a good match. I know that there was a, a huge mistake that <laughs> happened at the top rope that, that you continued to go on about for three days in our group chat. <laughs> no, okay. That was okay. There's botches <laughs> that you can complain about. That was damn near day. That is amateur. That's not a botch. I mean, that's uh, in all honesty, Kenny can, uh, Fixate wait, on my wait, unique was that, fixation. Was that Cabana's fault or was that Jericho's fault? I, I don't think care. That was Jericho's fault. I don't care who's. I, I didn't say Cole Cabana sucks. I said just the presentation of it. This yeah, is this is my good. point. My point is not to fixate on the botch. My point is professional wrestling on television should be the highest quality stuff that's available. AEW, like if that, my thinking is 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 not to fixate on the botch. My thinking is to elevate the level of quality. That's in a company to raise this the stock. If AEW continues to go down this road, you're not going to have a company, and we're going to have one less show to talk about. Maybe we'll have shorter shows. Maybe it'll, it will be beneficial. But I'm I'm seeking the potential interest of AEW. And when AEW has a show that's broadcast to a million people, and the spot comes up, and like you've said, maybe they don't prepare it this way, but. It, it comes up and you're like, okay, you're gonna go on my shoulder, and I'm gonna do this. It's like, no, 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 no. This is too dangerous. Don't do it. Because all of a sudden, Jericho's on Cabana's shoulder, and they both fall over the rope? It was bad. It's unprofessional. It's unbecoming of a professional wrestling company. And especially for Jericho and for Cole Cabana. Keep it clean. Keep it violent. You don't. Need, you guys are in your 50s and 40s. You don't need to be doing this. Wrestle. Do the psychology. That move is not needed. So that's my point, is that there has to be somebody saying... Don't do this. What are your spots? Tell me. You don't have to tell me move for move. What are your high spots? That one, I don't like it. It's not happening. Or, like Kenny said, be on high spot alert. Okay, he said he's doing this. We didn't like it. Put a little star next to it. Have the camera cut away for a second. Go to the crowd. Having There's got to be one person with his ha- hand on his head or something. Or, or go to the announcers. Oh, my God. You, we're going to you. We're going to you. Expand, uh, bullshit. Bullshit. Oh, my God. I can't believe what we just saw. You have announcers and you take two seconds off. Cover the cover the guy's asses. It was embarrassing. No, I mean, look, and I, I agree with you. It was it was not a great spot. It was not very good. It, it's weird because I, I get where Kenny comes from, right? Because I do feel like sometimes you are on botch alert, right? Like you are constantly looking for him, and you're very quick to call them out. And I get where Kenny's coming from because shit happens. Like it is, it is <laughs> live. It is fast. It is action. You are you are. Usually two men who are incredibly sweaty and slippery. Stuff's going to happen. Things aren't going to go right. So I'm generally more forgiving, and I'm usually willing to overlook it and give it a pass. But this was not very good. And Ooh. sometimes the production and the commentary team should be better and should do a better job. And that being said, I don't think what we got this week wrestling-wise was all that good. I don't think Monday Night Raw was all that good. I don't. I, I really don't. Did not enjoy Dynamite. I felt like Dynamite was almost a waste of two hours of my time. So when I'm going to give points to the show of the week, I'm going to give it to a show I didn't even watch. I did not watch NXT. I heard it was good. I read some of the reviews, but I didn't watch it. I just know that I did not enjoy Monday Night Raw, 
and I found Dynamite to be even less enjoyable. So I'm going to give my share of the point this week to NXT for whatever it was that they did. Who do you want to give your your, yeah, your half the point to for yeah, show of the week? Yeah, NXT show of the week was was definitely worthy of claiming the prize. I thought it was a very good show. I think they're moving in the right direction. Good storylines, a lot of developing characters that you want to see, and you can definitely this week you can definitely make the argument that some of the shows did not uh, did not handle business. But definitely by the time uh, SmackDown rolls around, I think SmackDown will also produce a good show this week too. I hope so. And look, that'll be that'll be the go home show towards Saudi Arabia. Everybody's already landed in Saudi Arabia. Uh, everybody's there, so it's going to be a pre-taped episode. So hopefully it's good. Hopefully we get no botches, or if there's botches, they can cut those out. Um, I Also, something real quick, real quick note on Saudi Arabia. There has been some intelligence that has been sent to WWE uh, from the U.S. government. Iran is plotting or planning some attack on Saudi Arabia. So everybody in WWE is hyper aware, hyper vigilant about this. Uh, there are precautions, there are procedures that already have been installed into place to, to basically protect the wrestlers and protect WWE in case something does happen. So I just want to get that out there real quick because that has been a lot of talk with them going to Saudi Arabia as it is. So just want to put that out there. You ready for some news and notes? Hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes. What made your list? So we opened uh, the show talking about a possible forbidden door. WWE may have its own forbidden door opening soon. Last week, we discussed the possibility of New Japan Pro Wrestling working with WWE to get the never open weight belt off of Carl Anderson. Well, there may be a new Japanese wrestling organization taking it one step further. Announcer of their official Twitter account, Pro Wrestling Noah, confirmed that Shinsuke Nakamura would be returning to Japan to face the Great Muda. This match is scheduled to take place at Noah's New Year's 2023 show on January 1st of 2023 and forms part of the Great Muda's retirement. Nakamura is currently under contract with WWE and called the booking a miracle on Twitter, whilst Kevin Owens said the match is going to rule. The arrangement is a stark contrast to kind of what has developed between Carl Anderson and New Japan Pro Wrestling. So a little bit interesting here. Now, sticking with New Japan Pro Wrestling and Carl Anderson, a new opponent will be slotted into his slot at New Japan Pro Wrestling's Oscada uh, at Battle Autumn on November 5th. So taking place on Saturday, uh, there is a New Japan Wrestling show that's supposed to take place and Carl Anderson was supposed to be there Thought was he was going to drop the the never open weight belt. That's not happening. So in a statement released by New Japan Pro Wrestling, they highlighted how they've attempted to get the match with Anderson and Hikaleo finalized, but alas, they've had to move on and they found a replacement. Uh, they continued in their statement saying, after a challenge from uh, Takahashi uh, in a direct request of Hikaleo, Osaka will now see a non-title special singles match between uh, Takahashi and Hikaleo. New Japan holds it. They continue to say New Japan holds its champions champions to the highest standard of professionalism. We deeply apologize for the inconvenience and disappointment caused by this matter. Again, this match between Anderson and Hikaleo was set on October 4th. Anderson and Gallows showed up to WWE on October 10th. So it seems like there was some not so great business done with Carl Anderson and New Japan there. Every week we keep getting more and more news on CM Punk. And if you're a CM Punk fan, this may crush you just a little bit. Nick Houseman appeared on Wrestling Observer Radio. This is the reporter that Punk started to undress at the All Out Scrum. Uh, but now his camp basically confides in him and basically goes to him when there's something that they want put out there. During an appearance, Houseman said, I have a lot of people that have known Punk that say to me that this guy is never going to wrestle again. Houseman ended up citing money not being an issue and some work Punk is doing in Hollywood as the reason why. Punk recently worked with Stephen Amell on a series called Heels, and Amell was very uh, very congratulatory towards Punk and seems like he wants to bring him back and work him back into that fold. So CM Punk may never, ever wrestle again. However, AEW is releasing Christmas bulbs with CM Punk on it. So at this point, I don't really know what the hell to make of the CM Punk situation anymore. Uh, sticking in, tr sticking with trouble in the wrestling world, the investigation into Vince McMahon allegedly issuing hush bunny payments to former female employees of the WWE is now complete, according to a statement from WWE. 
The internal investigation was carried out as a result of an article in the Wall Street Journal detailing allegations of misconduct against Vince McMahon and John Laurinaitis. This led to McMahon stepping down as WWE's CEO in June of 2022 and subsequently retiring the following month while Laurinaitis was removed from the company. WWE's statement came ahead of a call on November 2nd's filing and discussing the earnings for the third quarter of 2022. The f- filing confirmed the ending of the investigation and is quoted as saying, the special committee investigation is now complete and the special committee has been disbanded. Management is working with the board to implement the recommendations of the special committee related to the investigation. We're going to have to wait and see what the special recommendations from the special committee are and what WWE plans to implement. And finally, a WWE star may have very seriously injured himself. On November 1st edition of NXT, R-Truth took on Grayson Waller. During the picture-in-picture segment, it appeared that something wasn't right with Truth. Medical staff immediately attended to him, and the picture-in-picture faded away, and it just turned into a regular commercial. Now, Dave Meltzer has provided some insight into what may have happened when he was reporting that this wasn't this wasn't confirmed at press time, but the belief is that he tore his quad, which is a very serious injury and could keep him out for a very long time. If you remember, Vince McMahon tore both of his quad muscles and was sidelined for a long time. Triple H also tore a quad muscle, sidelined for a long time. This is a, a, an injury that you can come back from, but it is hard and it hurts and it will sideline you for a very long time, probably six months. Maybe a year you'll be on the shelf. So hopes and prayers for our truth. Hopefully he gets better fast and hopefully it's not a torn quad, but that is what it initially appears to be. That's going to do it for this week's wrestling news and notes. Little cash update, Barrett Sports Media, who we really follow. They talk a lot about uh, inside scoop about knowledge and cover the media. They just posted that WWE just posted Q3 gains, 15% WWE media revenue. Uh, WWE media revenue up 15% in the third quarter. So WWE looking up, trending up, ratings up, storylines up. So, you know, I think that uh, for WWE, they need to keep the momentum rolling. And for AEW, they need to tighten the ship as they move forward here for the the, the last two months of 2022. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at AdamRSCROZ. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. If you've agreed or, or disagreed with any of our predictions, hit us up. Let us know. Let us know if you think that we're on pace, we're on track, or if our takes are way off in regards to how you're seeing things. Hit us up at Detroit Podcast. Anywhere that you find your favorite podcast, just type in Detroit Sports Podcast, and our content will find you. As we break down AEW, WWE, Impact, all things going on in the world of wrestling, we will break it down here on the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast.